And over here, more, for more people. You guys are just going to be on the fringes. <laughs> well, let's see. Oh, I know what's going on. I'm looking that way. That's a problem. Yeah, that works. Let's see here. Well, it's good to have you all here. Um, some faces we haven't seen before who are brought here by faces we have seen before. And it's good to have you visit. Uh, some even return. Yeah. Sophie and Chris at least return. You've been here more than once. Yeah. Ah, so, um, and the rest of you we, we know from previous times too. So uh, what we do here, we just have a time for anyone to ask questions about the Bible or about anything you're perplexed about in the scripture or in the Christian faith, so uh, it's, it's sort of no, no subject matter assigned, you know, just to whatever is on your mind. We do that until we run out of time. So why don't we just pray and we'll get started here. Thank you, Father, for these uh, new people that we get to meet as well as old friends that we see fairly seldom because we meet so seldom to do this. I pray that you'll make this time a, a blessing for all. I do pray you keep uh, those who have not had COVID safe from getting it and uh, from those of us who have had it and I pray father that you'll uh, make this a time of learning and and actually edification and even even worship of sorts as we seek the scriptures seek the truth in the scriptures and I pray that your Holy Spirit will be our guide and our teacher uh, because we know that it, only what we learn through him is uh, going to be of value to us and to our spiritual lives and so we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, now, um, we've got a bunch of Bible students here from the Bible College, so that's, that, that makes for good questions, too. But anyone uh, who wants to start us off is free to do it. It's very informal here. Oh, oh, by the way, there's a bathroom through there, a men's bathroom to the left, women's to the right. And uh, there's food and coffee in the back. Feel free to get up and serve yourself some, although it would be nice if we don't leave cr crumbs on the floor here when we leave, um, but uh, it's, it's that informal. Uh, we, we'd love it if we were meeting in a home, but uh, it doesn't work out sometimes the size of crowds we have. So uh, just feel at home anyway. Rocky, yes. Oh, when he saw uh, all the kingdoms of the world and so forth. Isn't that really a, a real thing? Where, you know, well, it was a real offer. It was a real offer. You know, the thing about uh, the temptation of Jesus is it's told in such a way as if Jesus and the devil are standing there looking at each other, having a conversation like you and I are right now. Um, but, I mean, Jesus was tempted the same way we are, the Bible says. He's tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. And so I suspect it was more of a temptation going on in his mind. And, and the devil can call things to mind. He could show him in a vision type way all the kingdoms of the earth. The Bible said it took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth and their glory. Well, you go on the highest mountain in Israel and look around, you're not going to see all the kingdoms of the earth from there. It's, they're not close enough. But he could show it to them, in a, reveal it to them. And even when he took him on, into the temple, on the pinnacle of the temple to jump off, it's, it's possible that this was going on in his mind. Of course, it's something he was actually being tempted to do. He could leave where he was and go to the temple and jump off, and that's what the devil is suggesting that he do. I mean, these were real temptations to do these things, but I don't know that, you know, during the 40 days Jesus was in the wilderness that he actually made a journey with Satan to the temple and then came back and then went up a high mountain and saw all the kingdoms of the world. In fact, um, I've often uh, felt that these were probably coming to him like our, our temptations come to us. In other words, not that, not that the devil is facing him uh, visibly. I mean, when I'm tempted, the devil doesn't appear to me. If he did, it'd make it a lot easier to resist temptations. So I say, oh, I know who you are, you know? Yeah, you, I'm not going to let you drag me off to, you know, 
you know, apostasy or something, but temptations only work on us usually because they're subtle, because we don't realize it's the devil talking to us. It's, you know, they come to our mind, and the devil brings them to our mind. And we picture something that would be tempting to do. And uh, <coughs> there's a certain course of thought that comes with it. I, I think that Jesus, I mean, I, I, if someone said, no, I, I, I believe Jesus had to be seen the devil face to face having the conversation just like that, I've got nothing against it. I just, over the years, contemplating the temptation of Jesus, have uh, felt it more likely that since his temptation was like ours, and it'd, it'd be easy to say no to Satan, if he was standing right there in front of you and you know it was the devil, wouldn't it? So it sure would for me. Uh, I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't fall to any temptation if they all came like that because I know oh, there's the devil. I just need to ignore him. But uh, our temptations come, creep into our heads and re represent themselves as our own ideas, which is that's why our guard is down because we don't usually guard ourselves from ourselves. And so my thought is that uh, the whole temptation sequence, while Jesus was out there, you know, he's looking at bread, and the devil, I mean, he's looking at stones, and the devil says, why don't you turn some of those into bread? You're hungry, right? Now, that doesn't mean that there was a confrontation visible with the devil. I mean, the devil could just put that in his head. And the other temptations, too. The other possibility is that it was strictly uh, a visible, literal, uh, almost physical confrontation, which included some travel. You know, the, the devil led him, led him up to the pinnacle of the temple. So... What, Jesus follows the devil around and goes, you know, traveling through uh, southern Judea to go to the temple with him and uh, climbs up there. And wonder how you, how you even get up there. Yeah, but I, my own thoughts are that his temptation was very much like our own. And the way we sometimes picture it, especially the way it's depicted in pictures and things like that, uh, I suspect is not as accurate as it could be of what really happened. I think the temptation was thoughts in his head that the devil put there. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that he, uh, well, I mean, I'm saying he, he could have had, you know, a visual representation to his mind of uh, seeing all the, he could picture himself on a mountain looking at all the world and the devil says, to him, hey, I'll give you all these kingdoms they're mine to give, just bow down and worship me. All of that could have taken place internally in his head, just like like our temptations do, generally speaking. I, I, I just feel that the Bible indicates that the temptation of Jesus was quite similar to our own, quite analogous to it. Um, but only one person I know claims to have ever seen the devil, and uh, we all get tempted, but not usually by seeing the devil and having him have a, speak to us audibly and so forth. Um, but it's, it's equally you know, accurate, I think, if the devil puts something in my mind, say, well, the devil said... The devil, you know, suggested that I do such and such a thing. If he's the source of the thought, then that's uh, a, a legitimate way of speaking about it. Because, I mean, it says the devil came to him when he'd been fasting for 40 days. Um, well, I think the devil comes to us sometimes, too. But, it, you know, I don't, I don't know if we're supposed to picture the devil hiking through the desert out to see Jesus, and he watches it come from the distance. I wonder what he's going to say. You know, it's just the story is very brief. Um... I, I don't know that, I don't think there's anything wrong with picturing it more in a literal sense of the devil standing there, but I don't think that the way it's told requires us to think that it's that different from the way we get tempted. But I have no emotional stake in it, so I mean, if it turned out the other way, it would be fine with me. Anyone else? Usually it only takes one question to get the get the ball rolling, then everyone has it. Yes, uh, um, Gibson, right? Yes, Gibson. Mm -hmm. In um, Genesis 20, um, Abraham and Amalek have their first exchange. And when asked about Sarah, uh, Abraham explains that she is his sister. Is Abraham lying in that instance because sister in Hebrew means biological relative and Sarah is the biological relative of Abraham. Well, when he was confronted about his deception, when Abimelech said, why did you tell me she's your sister? Abraham said, well, she actually is my sister. 
Uh, we have the same father. He was, she was his half-sister. Yeah. Apparently, his, Tara, his father, must have had more than one wife, and, and so they were half-siblings, and they got married. Uh, although he also explained the reason I deceived you was because I thought someone might kill me to take her from me uh, because she was apparently very desirable. It's kind of ironic to think that someone who, someone would kill him to take his wife when you think, well, if you want, if you want his wife, just steal her. You know, why, why murder a guy? Although people do that to this day. But they had an ethic in the ancient world that, uh, in, in the very ancient world, that apparently it's, it's wrong to, you know, take a man's wife when he's living, but it's okay to kill him. <laughs> you know, so you can take it. That's paganism for you. It's not, it's not biblical morals. But, uh, yeah, she actually, as it turned out, was his sister. But even if he had been lying, uh, well, he was, he was telling a half-truth, which in this case was in order to <coughs> deceive, so it's as good as a lie in a way, you know. Technically, I'm not wrong. I'm half right, you know. Uh, but really, the, he had 100% deceived by saying it. So it was a lie of sorts. <coughs> um, so... You know, the Bible doesn't depict Abraham or anyone else in the Bible as a perfect person. Uh, everybody we know of in the Bible, with very few exceptions, there are sins recorded against them. And the ones that don't have sins recorded against them, we have to assume there must be sins that were not recorded. That they committed. Like Joseph, uh, who was sold into Egypt, there's no sin of his recorded in the Bible, <coughs> nor Daniel. But I don't think we're supposed to understand that those men never sinned in their lives, you know. And uh, most of the guys, even the great guys in the Bible, have sins on their record in the Bible. You know, the Bible tells of them sinning. And for him to lie about his, his wife like that was no doubt to be, we, we shouldn't be whitewashed, you know. It was no doubt a sin. Put her in danger. And it was a deception anyway. Now, uh, if he had lied to save her life, um, like, uh, say, Richard Wormbrandt, when he was being tortured by the communists and asked where the secret meetings of the Christians were and to write down all their leaders so they could be arrested, he'd lie. He's, he wasn't ashamed of it. He'd say, I lied. He said, "There's uh, it, whatever you have to do out of love for the brethren, it's, uh, it's a higher ethic to love your brothers and save their lives than to, than to always tell the truth, even if the truth will be dangerous. He and Brother Andrew, who used to smuggle Bibles into communist countries, said that um, when he was asked by border guards why he's coming into the country, he'd say, I'm visiting my brothers. You know, well, he's really bringing cartons of Bibles illegally into these communist countries. But his visiting his brothers was a half-truth, you know. I have to say, I've done the same thing going into Canada sometimes to teach for YWAM, because uh, uh, it's complicated teaching for YWAM. They, I don't charge for my teaching. But they usually give me an honorarium. So, I mean, if, if I'm going up there to teach and they say, well, are you going to get paid? Well, not exactly, you know. Well, what do you mean not exactly? Well, I don't charge anything, but they give me something. Then there's be all kinds of hassles. I usually just say I'm going up to visit friends because I am. Those people, I, I go up regularly and visit them. I also teach for a week when I'm up there. But uh, it's a half-truth. But it's, you know, Brother Andrew, you say, I withhold information from them that they have no right to know. They have no right to know what I'm doing on my father's business, you know, if I'm sneaking Bibles in, uh, their forbidding of it is illegal. But, you know, so I'm doing what they would call illegal. That's what God commands me to do. It's sort of like we must obey God rather than man. There's a lot of controversy among uh, evangelicals about whether lying is ever a moral thing to do or not. Um, Canadian Border Patrol, if they're watching the Internet, now know your secret. Yeah, now they know. I'm sure a lot of them are watching right now. <laughs> So I'll have to come up with another answer to give them. But anyway, the, uh, I, there are a lot of evangelicals who say that you know, there is a hierarchy of ethics that God recognizes. Just like Jesus said that the Pharisees, you know, they paid their tithes of mint, anise, and cumin, but they neglect cumin. But they neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. So some issues are weightier with God than others are. And... Uh, you know, David ate the showbread, which was against the law, against God's law to do. But it, since it was to save his life, he was considered justified in doing it. So there are times when violations of lesser laws were considered to be justifiable when it was, you know, for a, a more humane purpose to save a life or something like that. 
that's that's an ethical issue that probably still needs to be debated. <laughs> but there's an increasing number of evangelicals that have taken that stand. That there are times when, if telling the truth would endanger somebody else's life, then it's more loving to not tell the truth. Then there's the counter to that, because there's the famous story about how Corrie ten Boom, living in Nazi-occupied Holland, was hiding Jews. And uh, this, this story didn't happen in her house where they were hiding Jews, but a friend, uh, another friend of theirs was hiding Jews in their house under the kitchen floor. And uh, the trap door that went to the hiding place was under the kitchen table, and the table had a uh, tablecloth that hung all the way down to the ground, so you couldn't see that there's a trap door under it. And uh, the alarm was sent that the Gestapo was coming once, and all the Jews in the house fled and got, you know, escaped down into the, into the hole under the floor in the kitchen. And then they replaced the tablecloth and everything like that, so it was hidden. And the Nazis came in, and they said, where are the Jews? And there was, like a th I think, a three-year-old little girl there. And it was a Christian family, so she was told always to tell the truth. So her family was sweating bullets, thinking, you know, hope she doesn't tell the truth this time, because she knew where the Jews were. And telling the truth would get them arrested and probably killed. And the little girl didn't know the nuances of, of these ethics, so she just said, they're under the table. And, you know, her parents were shocked and terrified because that's, in fact, where they were. And so the Nazi, the Gestapo, got down and started to lift up the tablecloth, and the little girl just started laughing like crazy. And he thought he was being mocked, so he, he, he let the tablecloth down and went and looked in the other rooms and left. Didn't find the Jews, but because... Uh, I guess God uh, tickled the little girl so that she'd laugh at that moment, and even though she told the truth, God prevented the Jews from being caught. So some would say, see, you can tell the truth all the time, even when you think it's going to save someone's life to lie, and God can honor it. So that's the debate goes both ways, and um, I don't know if it'll be settled, because there are cases in the Bible where people like David you know, would break the law, a lesser law, in order to save his life and the life of the people with him. Uh, <coughs> so Abraham, he said he was lying to save his own life. I, I think a man should be willing to lay his lifetime for his wife, but uh, for her safety. If he had lied to save her life, it might be a little different issue. I don't know. It might have been okay. But I, <coughs> I, don't, I don't justify Abraham for doing that. So drilling down a little bit more on that, you mentioned Joseph putting no recorded sins of his although he deceived and sabotaged his brother. So uh, how would you categorize that? <clears throat> what Joseph did to his brothers in the end of the story was not necessarily sinful. Um, he was toying with them, to be sure. And he, he had a purpose in it. I mean, he never, he concealed from them who he was. And it, that's true. I mean, sometimes concealing certain truths is not the same thing as lying, you know. Uh, but he was deceiving them into not knowing it was him. Uh, but what he did with them, with the cup hidden in the sack and so forth, was very ingenious. And it was not really, he didn't do anything sinful in the process that I can think of, but it was a brilliant thing to do because he hadn't seen his brothers in, you know, over, uh, you know, uh, 20 years or something, I think, at that point. Th that's why they didn't recognize him. He was a teenager when they'd seen him last. Now he's pushing 40, probably. And um, now he had a beard and things like that. And he spoke a different language and they is the last place they expected to see their brother who they sold into slavery as, you know, ruling Egypt. So it, it just didn't occur to them. He even pretended he didn't understand their language when they spoke in Hebrew to each other. Um, but what, they, what he did, and the story's ingenious, I didn't understand this for many years when I was reading it as a youth, but I eventually saw what it, he was doing. He wanted to see if they'd repented or not, because the last time he'd seen them, they'd sold him into slavery. Why? Because they were jealous of him, because he was his father's favorite. And they're out of jealousy. Uh, they brought great grief on their father, but they didn't care because they just hated their rival. Now, in the years that Joseph was gone, Benjamin had become the father's favorite. He was now the youngest. And Joseph was curious to know if these men had changed. Would they do it again? If, if they were put in the same situation with Benjamin as they were in with Joseph, would they, would they get rid of him too? I mean, if they hadn't changed, then they, you would think they would. And so he made it very easy for them to get rid of Benjamin if they were so inclined. You know, he, he hid the cup in the bag of, of Benjamin's grave. And then he sent his servants and, and said, someone stole the cup. And they said, 
uh, whoever has stole the cup, kill him, and we'll all be your slaves. And, and, and Joseph's servant said, no, that's, that's, un, that's not okay. You can all go accept the one who has the cup, and he'll be my slave. And so, to everybody's surprise, it was found in Benjamin's sack, which means Benjamin was not going to be a slave in Egypt. Just like his brothers had sold him into Egypt as a slave, now, through no fault of their own, they could leave Benjamin in Egypt as a slave and be done with him like they were of Joseph. They were in exactly the position to conveniently get rid of him, too, if they were jealous of him. And uh, the remarkable thing about the story is how unwilling they were to do that. Uh, and so, you know, how, how all of them said, no, we're going to go back with him and, and we'll be your slaves. Uh, we're, we're, and they could have just gone home and said, Dad, you know, this is not our fault. The guy took Benjamin as a slave, you know. So, and that would have, of course, broken their father's heart, as they knew. But they wouldn't do it. And so they, Joseph saw that they were, had become different men. They were repentant. So that was his way of putting them in the position to be tested to see if he should forgive them or not. Um, if they were, if they'd had a different change, had a change of heart. Which was a brilliant and very moving story. So I don't think, I, I don't think we'd say that he sinned in that case. I don't know of any commandment of God that he violated when he did all that, but he was, he was toying with them. I mean, he was, he was probably having a little fun at their expense, but it wasn't malicious. It was, it was for a purpose. <clears throat> it was actually with a mind to be reconciled with them if they were repentant and it proved they were. Any further? Any, who, what have you guys been reading lately? You're in class, right? Classes are in session? What are you guys studying? Psalms. Psalms? No questions about the Psalms? Oh, no. well, there's a lot of questions can be asked about the Psalms. Yes? In Scripture, when you're talking about the uh, two men on their way to court, uh -huh. and Matthew 5, being uh, told that they should get that resolved before they get to court, mm -hmm. otherwise the judge is going to have to deal with them. Right. Is, is that really talking about God being the judge and we're the people that are on our way to court? That's how most people see it, but I don't. Uh, it, it was always confusing to me there in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus said, agree with your adversary quickly while you're in the way with him lest he turn you over to the judge and the judge turn you over to the officer and the officer turn you over to the jailer and he says you won't get out of there until you paid your last farthing. Uh, I've always tried to, I, well, not always, but when I was younger, I always kind of thought, figure out, is this talking about, you know, God is the judge and he's going to hand us over to some angels who are like jailers and they're going to torment us, as they'll torment, deliver over to the tormentors? Uh, the, uh, you know, actually Roman Catholics use that to uh, justify belief in purgatory because as you won't get out of there until you've paid the last farthing, implying that after you've, you know, after you've spent how much time you need to spend in there, you'll get out, is what they see, they hear that saying. So that's sort of a, a, a term, a, a story that people use who are Catholic to support purgatory. And people who think of hell that way, people who think of hell as a reformatory that people get out of, they sometimes have used that story too. See, he, the judge delivers them over to the jailer and they, they goes, he goes into the jail until they've paid their debt and then allege, seemingly they're, they're free then after that. <laughs> but there's no suggestion here that he's talking about the afterlife or that he's even talking about God. In that section of the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking about justice in general. The illustrations he gives in this section, I think, all illustrate the need for justice in our lives, that we should be just and fair and, and concerned about not wronging other people. Now, the picture is he assumes you're guilty of doing something to your brother. Why? Well, because he assumes you'll go to jail if it ends up in court. So you must be guilty. At least that's the default assumption. He says, the idea is if you've done something against your brother and it's actionable, don't just try to avoid it. Don't try to avoid him and avoid court because he could take you to court and then you end up in jail. That's a, that's a motivation for reconciliation. Because he then goes on to say, and if you bring your gift to the altar and you there remember your brother has something against you, again, you've done something against him and so he's holding it against you. Both, both of these parts 
assume that you have done something to injure your brother and you've left it uh, unaddressed. You've just let it go. Well, one, one consequence could be that you end up in jail for it. Another consequence could be that God won't accept your worship. Leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Don't even offer it. Go make peace with your brother and then come back and offer it. So he's saying you could be in trouble with God and you can be in trouble with men. God might not accept your worship if you don't reconcile. And frankly, even on the human level, you could suffer consequences. You go to jail. And when he says you won't get out of there until you've paid your last penny, I think what he's saying is don't think that because you're my disciple, God's going to work some kind of miracle to get you out of jail if you're there at your own fault. You know, if you had opportunity to make right what you've done wrong, if you, if you could have gotten made peace with your angry brother over what you've done, you should have done it. If it comes to court and you go in jail, don't ask God to bail you out. You're there because you deserve to be. You should have avoided it. I think that's what he's saying in, in that section of Matthew 5. Hi, guys. Good to see you. This is the quietest group. I guess we don't have Donna Lynn here, right? Yeah. We have a whole group of young people on that with this quiet as very interesting. Well, they're shy because they haven't been here before. But, but certainly our Bible students must have Bible questions. Yes? Um, I have a question about Job because he, that book is so amazing, but it almost seemed like it was thrown in, although we're able to learn so much about it. It's like, okay, so where did he come from? Like, what his, like, significant, even though God said that he was, like, a servant and God really did love him, but at the same time, as soon as the book is over, that's it. You won't hear about Job ever again. Yeah. Well, that's not too unusual in the Bible. I mean, there are stories of a number of people. Balaam, for example, you know, he kind of appears out of nowhere, and then when his story's over, he's, he's gone. You know, there are... Um, that's kind of how history is too. We appear, we have our story, and then we're gone and might not be heard from again. But in the case of Job, uh, the, the story of Job uh, is probably only related in order to talk about his trials and, and the things that happened in connection with his trials. He obviously had a long life because he had more children later on and like 10 more, you know, and, uh, and had had a long life before that because he had 10 at the beginning. So he had a long life before and after the story and the book only is interested in this particular story in his life. And um, yeah, it's not really like the Bible to cover the whole biography of someone from birth to death, uh, you know, every character in the Bible, even, even the heroes, some of them. I mean, Abraham, we, we meet him when he's 75 years old, but he lives to be 175, and we do follow his story to his death. And his, his story is significant in a different way than Job's is. Job, Job is an example of a guy who really suffered every kind of crisis that people might suffer. And when people suffer crises like that, they always wonder, where's God? You know, wh you know, why is God doing this to me? Is God angry at me? You know, is God even there? Is there even a God? You know, uh, and those are the kinds of questions that Job answers. And Job is a very excellent case to use because of the extreme suffering that he went through. And, um, it seems like it all happened at once. You know, his kids died. His, all his livestock was stolen. He was the richest man in the East. And, and yet he was a worshiper of God. You know, he wasn't Jewish. Um, the evidence within the book, I think all scholars would agree, was that his story is placed in the patriarchal period. That's during the time of Abram, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob's sons. Uh, and yet, you know, he, one of his friends was uh, Eliphaz the Temanite. Now, Teman was a son of Esau, which would mean Teman would be an Edomite. And it may be that Job was an Edomite, too. He was one of the greatest men of the East. And from the perspective of Israel, East, if it's Southeast, it's, it's Edom. And so he might have been an Edomite. At least one of his friends was a Temanite, which was an Edomite. And, but what's interesting is it gives us something of the timing. It had to be after Esau's time. That means after Jacob, because Jacob and Esau were twins. So... Esau had a son named Teman, and then from him came Temanites, and Eliphaz, one of Job's friends, was a Temanite. So he had to be at least two generations after Jacob himself. Well, Jacob and his family went into Egypt in Jacob's lifetime, and his descendants were there for hundreds of years. So most likely, Job was a man living possibly in Edom uh, during the time the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt during that period of time. So it's kind of a, that's probably the time setting of it. 
the reason he's mentioned is because he was a godly man, which is interesting because it means that even after God had chosen Abraham and his family and had them, you know, baking in Egypt, he was, uh, he still had people in pagan lands who were worshipers of him, like, like Job, Edomites even. Um, and, you know, Job offered sacrifices, but he didn't do so in a temple. He, you know, he'd offer sacrifices in his home, which is what happened during the patriarchal period. Abram did that. And Isaac and Jacob offered sacrifices on their own home-built altars. So the, the, the worship of uh, Job's worship and, and his setting seems to be in the patriarchal period uh, during the time that the uh, Israelites were in Egypt. Now, the, the story of Job is there to show us that uh, our sufferings, even when they come upon us unjustly, um, they, they actually come from God in the sense, well, I mean, the devil is the one who brings them, but it's God who sent them. You know, the devil had to come to God and get permission. The devil complained that God kept a hedge around Job so that the devil couldn't touch him or any of his stuff. So, I mean, this is the default situation with God's people is God protects them and the devil can't do what he wants with them. He has to get permission from God. And that's reassuring if you trust God. If you're not a truster of God, and you say, well, these trials, God let me have these trials, that's his fault, I don't love him anymore. But if you know that God's good, and that these trials are only there with his permission, then, I mean, the only thing you can conclude is, these must be for a good purpose. You know, that it gives meaning to our sufferings, which otherwise seem random and meaningless. That, oh, God has a lot, God who cares for me, God who is interested in my, in my happiness and my well-being and my destiny, he's the one who has decided how much he will let me suffer. Because he God always put restrictions on saying, you go this far, but don't go by, beyond that line. So, I mean, it, it's a very reassuring thing to a person who loves and trusts God to know that whatever happens to me, loss of children, that's a horrible thing to happen. Loss of all your property, loss of your health. Uh, you know, you, you can't lose much more than that without losing your life itself. But <clears throat> if any of those happens to you, it's because God has deliberately allowed it. Remember, Jesus said, not a sparrow falls to the ground apart from the will of your father. Although sparrows do fall to the ground, but not apart from the will of the father. And so also, if, 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 a, if a bird can't die apart from God's permission, then your children can't die, you, you can't die, you know, your parents can't die, your friends can't die without God's permission. I mean, people are worth more than sparrows. So the, the point of Job is the sovereignty of God. But another point is that people who reason uh, that suffering is always the result of sin are reasoning ignorantly, because that was Job's phil philosophical friend's opinion, you know, and, he, and his too before this happened, when they said, you know, we've seen that if people live righteous lives, they flourish and they're rich and their children, you know, are healthy and happy and give them many grandchildren and so forth. I mean, that's, that's what his friend said every time they got the chance to speak. And Job at one point said, I know all that. You know, I, I would have said the same thing myself before all this happened. But he said, the problem here is I didn't do anything. You know, I didn't do anything wrong. I've, I've lived an upright life. And so they just got mad at him for being proud, uh, as they thought. You know, you're being proud because you're not admitting that you did the wrong thing. Just you should admit it. And then he got angry. He had a pretty good, pretty good attitude in the first few chapters. But eventually in these discussions with his friends, he got irked for being blamed falsely for things he knew he hadn't done. So, you know, he seemed to be a really multi-dimensional man. He's not, <clears throat> he's not a cardboard cut out of a saint. You know, he's, he's a good man. He's, he hadn't done anything wrong to bring this on him. But he, he, had, he, he got a little hissy-fitty kind of too, but, but with his friends more than with God. The thing is, though, the, the book of Job makes it very clear that although his friends were the wise men of the region, and had reasoned and f philosophized about the meaning of life and suffering and all that stuff, as wise men do, they were wrong. They were, it was too simplistic. They thought that if, if you're suffering, it's because you're being punished. And the book of Job makes it very clear that's not at all what was happening in his case, nor should we assume it's the, the case in other people's cases necessarily. That suffering is a more complex issue. And the book of Job is so, it's a wonderful book because it's the only book uh, that we have from God himself answering the question that everyone asks. All, all religions try to answer it. You know, is it karma, bad karma? You know, is that why I'm suffering? Because I did something bad in a previous life? Uh, or, I mean, almost everyone 
wonders why do good people suffer and job is the only book in the bible that's dedicated entirely to addressing that but although it addresses it it doesn't answer it it never tells why job suffered in the early chapters we know that it was a test you know that job was being accused by the devil of having a shallow love for god that could be easily ended by simply bringing some trials into his life and god was betting that he wouldn't lose his faith that was the test and that's the, the background but job didn't know about that background all he knew is woke up one morning it was a good day and suddenly by the evening his kids were dead his, his property was gone his servants were killed and he was the next day he was uh, you know covered with boils yeah he didn't know that backstory so anyway um job is a fantastically valuable book for that reason though it has long dialogues that contain philosophical musings that happen to be mistaken um but the interesting thing is once god shows up you expect the answer to come his friends have missed the point but now finally at the very end god shows up and talks for about six chapters and at, when god's finished talking he still hasn't answered the question you know why is job suffering no answer is given and i guess we're left to conclude that we're just supposed to trust that god has his reasons one one preacher said uh, what job teaches is that suffering is the price that a good man pays to glorify god and that's really what was going on uh, but as far as what happened to job after that his story is not continued except to say he lived to be very old he saw his children's children's children or whatever you know and uh, and he had more children so uh in other words it all it all turned out right but once once you get that point of resolution there doesn't seem to be anything in his life that was interesting enough or important enough to to justify pages in the Bible, you know. So, does that address your question? Okay. Yes. Yeah, brother, you had your hand up. Oh no, I, you brought up the idea that I was going to bring up about his friends are actually checking in. What, if you are such a good man, why are you suffering? Mm -hmm. If you're a god, why are you suffering? There's no god, and those are his closest friends. And you brought that out already. Yeah. And you know what? One thing it shows is that suffering demonstrates where your relationship with God is. If everything's going good and you go to church, you sing the songs, and you put money in the bag, and, and you kind of try to live a Christian life in a way, uh, you don't really know if your faith is very significant until, until God does something or allows something to happen that really is upsetting in your life, you know? And when, when you really have, when you have disappointments, when you have tragedies, you can go two ways with it, and people do, depending on what they already are before the tragedy strikes. People who love God, they, they're confused, they grieve the loss, but they say, but I trust God. Even if he slays me, I'll trust him, he said, Job said. Whereas a person who doesn't love God, really, and that's the kind of people Satan was most familiar with. Satan thought he knew people pretty well. He probably is a pretty good judge of human nature in general. But he said, any man will sacrifice will compromise to save his life he said skin for skin all that a man has will he give for his life so let me touch his body and he'll curse you to your face i mean satan had no doubt seen it very many times men who seemed very religious seemed very godly but all it took was some bad luck in their life and suddenly they're blaming god suddenly god's not the good guy in their mind anymore and that happens i mean i i've known people who had been in church all their life, but you know their child died and they never went to church again. They're, I can't believe in a God who let my child die. Well, Job believed in a God who let his children die, and uh, you know if if you love God and trust God, you love Him and trust Him even when He lets things happen that you wish wouldn't. And that's exactly what you're being tested about. Do you love Him or don't you? That's what that was what Job was being tested about. Did I see a hand a moment ago? Someone else? Yes, sir. It's a crazy thought, but um, do you see any foreshadowing about Job and what he experienced? And now Jesus is God, but he came as a man in the mm -hmm. So is there any foreshadowing, do you think, in, in Job to Jesus in 40 days after baptism? Was there any, like, typology where Job is kind of like parallel to Jesus? Well, he's, there certainly are parallels. Whether, uh, whether the New Testament artists would have... Uh, provided Job as an example of a type of Christ like they did with David and some others, I'm not sure, but they, it, it's, it certainly is not crazy to imagine it so. I mean, Job is said to have been a man who was blameless 
you know, who feared the Lord and avoided evil, that's a guy that you don't read of any sins in his life. And maybe a little bit when he got ouchy, you know, later in the book. But, uh, you know, he was, he's like a, a good man who suffered horribly. Uh, in that sense, he's parallel to Christ and, frankly, to a lot of other people that are the prophets. Jeremiah, you know, was a good man, but he suffered horribly. He was thrown into a pit. He was, you know, badly physically persecuted. Isaiah was a good man. He got sawn in two, you know. But uh, Joseph, again, we mentioned Joseph. There's a guy who was really a, an innocent man, at least, um, and yet suffered all kinds of uh, things. And he, like Job, like Job, he said at the end, well, to his brothers, you intended evil against me, but God meant it for good. You know, he, he knew that there's more than one layer of causation for his sufferings. He knew there was a human element, and they were bad guys. His brothers were bad guys, and they intended evil, as he said. But God is a good guy, and he overrules the bad guys. And so God intended it for good. So you can see that in any of your sufferings. You say, well, especially when they're caused by people. But any kind, you know, these circumstances intended to ruin me, but God meant to strengthen me um, or to use me in a situation um, as Job uh, or as Joseph. Yeah. You yes, sir. In Exodus 21, when Stephen or Titus and, and they don't have any God, do you think that's a justification for a pro life argument then? It's often used uh, as pro life, and then other times it's used to, to be against pro life. But the situation is it says if two men are, are striving and the wife of one of them re uh, is, is uh, or there's a pregnant woman present. And she gets jostled, and, and her seed passes from her, it says. Uh, it says, if, if there's no mischief that follows, that's, how, that's the language used, if no mischief follows, then, uh, you know, or if, if mischief follows, the man who caused her to lose the baby will be punished. If no mischief follows, then he'll have to pay the, the, the husband some fee, some penalty. Um, now, the question is, what does mischief following mean? You know, if it says, if no mischief follows, does that mean, well, the baby, of course, is lost because it's miscarried, but, but the woman survives and, you know, all, all turns out well except for the baby, then it's no, no big thing. If that's what it means, that is, if no mischief follows to the woman, even though the baby is lost, then, then it's not a big deal, in which case that'd be kind of against a pro-life argument. But in my understanding... It means if, if a baby dies in that situation, mischief has come. That is mischief. The baby has died, you know. But if no mischief follows, I think it means that if the baby comes prematurely, but, you know, it survives. You know, it's, you know babies sometimes are born prematurely and they survive. Um, that is to say, if it's late enough in the pregnancy and someone causes her to miscarry, but no one dies, it's all good, then then no one has to be seriously punished. Um, but if mischief follows, I would say the baby dying would be mischief following, as well as if the mother did. Then he says they'll be punished. Now, he doesn't say whether punishment would be the death penalty or not, but uh, I think it would be implied because the death penalty is clearly assigned for murder. Uh, you know, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, stripe for stripe, blow for blow, wound for wound, life for life. Is the law is the, uh, the law? So I think the punishment for killing an unborn baby uh, would be, uh, or a preborn baby, would be uh, probably the death penalty. But it's it's ambiguous enough when it says if no mischief follows or if mischief follows, does that mean if the baby survives, or if it just means the, though the baby doesn't survive, the woman survives, then no mischief. That interpretate I, I've heard it used both ways because some people take it one way and some another. However, you know, I don't think we need a specific scripture about abortion or miscarriage to identify an unborn baby as a human being. Uh, anyone can tell that a baby is a human being. You know, in the last, at least the last three months of the pregnancy, a baby can be born. It's essentially fully formed. There's probably its lungs aren't as completely formed as 
and maybe some other parts of the body, but I mean, babies that are born even at, at, at uh, six months, um, and now even younger, but they need incubators, you know, five months and even sooner. Uh, they often survive and, you know, they're human babies, but if they had been killed while they were in the womb at that stage, there's certain people who'd say that's not a baby. Why is it a baby if it's outside the womb, but it's not a baby if it's inside the womb? It's like saying, you know, I, if I go scuba diving, am I not a human when I'm underwater uh, on life support with scuba gear? But when I come out, I'm a human. But when I go back in, I'm not a human again. I mean, it's not where you are that makes you a human. It's what you are that makes you a human. And, you know, any thinking person before there were people trying to uh, justify murdering in, uh, unborn babies would know that's a baby in there. It's a living human being. It can't be anything else because it's living. You know that because it's growing. Rocks don't grow. They're not alive. Dirt doesn't grow. It's not alive, though. It has organisms in it. But things that aren't alive don't grow. It's growing, so it's alive. But what kind of life is it? Well, check the DNA. I think you'll figure it out real quick. It's human DNA. It's a growing human. And that's from the point of fertilization on. Uh, how else are you going to define a human being than a living human being, than a creature that's alive with human DNA? That's what makes a human. So the burden of proof is on anyone who says they're not human. What are they then? If they're not human, what are they? Uh, so you don't even need a specific scripture about abortion in order to know that it's killing a baby is killing a baby, and that's murder, you know? Yes, Chris. How could you tell the difference between conviction and condemnation? Like, where's the best thing? Right. How do, you, how do you know the difference between conviction from the Holy Spirit and condemnation from the devil, the accuser, the brethren? Well, they can feel the same, essentially, when you do something that you know is wrong and you feel guilty about it. Is that the devil or is that God? I mean, it could be either, but there is a way to find out. There's two differences. One is that if the Holy Spirit is convicting you, it's because he wants you to repent. He's on your side. Even though you do wrong, God loves sinners. Christ died for sinners. And so when you sin, God is still your father. He's still on your side. But he wants to reconcile. He, that requires you to repent. So the Holy Spirit makes you feel guilty or convicts you so that you will repent. Jesus said the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment in uh, John 16. So... Um, since it is the Holy Spirit's desire to reconcile and to bring you to repentance, certain things will be different than the devil, who has only the intention as to condemn you so that you'll, you'll want to leave, you, you'll, you won't feel worthy to talk to God. I mean, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. But if our heart does not condemn us, John says, then we have fellowship, we have a confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we you know, keep his commandments and do those things pleasing in his sight. So if our heart isn't condemning us, we have confidence toward God and our prayers are answered. If our heart does condemn us, obviously the opposite is true. We don't have confidence toward God. We can't come with great confidence and faith that God will answer our prayers. So the devil wants us not confident toward God. He wants us to feel guilty. The Holy Spirit doesn't want us to feel guilty permanently, but the devil wants us to feel guilty all the time because the guiltier we are, the more... Our, uh, the more our, our faith and our spiritual power is compromised. So here's the difference. The Holy Spirit, if he convicts you, he'll lay his finger on the specific thing he wants you to repent of because that's what he wants you to do is repent. Lots of people are guilty, but they can't think of anything in particular they're guilty of. They just feel vaguely like they're bad. I just feel like I'm bad. I just feel like I'm guilty all the time, you know? Well... That's going to be the devil doing that because the devil doesn't want you to repent of anything in particular. He'll even accuse you when you haven't done anything at all. All he wants is for you to feel the guilt because that will keep you from having confidence toward God. He doesn't even care if you sin or not. Sin is good for him because he can make you feel guilty about it. But he can make, if he can make you feel just as guilty when you didn't even sin, and that sometimes is the case, did I sin? Did I, I just feel guilty. Well, then it, gets us, it achieves the same purpose for saying he just wants the guilt. He wants you to feel guilty and condemned. So he's not going to be specific about anything you should repent of. The Holy Spirit will never be vague 
If he wants you to repent, he'll let you know what it is. <clears throat> if, he, if he just makes you feel guilty and you don't know what it is you did, well, how can you repent of that? You can't. There's nothing specific to repent of. So conviction of the Holy Spirit is going to be very specific, whereas the devil's condemnation could be specific, but often it's just very vague so that it makes it impossible for, to repent. You just have to walk around with this cloud of guilt on you. The other way it's different is that if the Holy Spirit's convicting you, when you repent, he's not going to keep convicting you. Repentance is what he's looking for. He tells you what it is you did wrong, and when you repent, he doesn't lay it on you anymore. The devil, he wants you to feel guilty all the time, no matter what you do. He'd like you to think that even if you repent, you're still guilty, because guilt is his game. So here's the two things. If, if, the, uh, if the guilt is not specific, I, I don't you know what I feel guilty, I just feel guilty. I just don't feel like God wants to talk to me. I, I, when I try to pray, I just feel like I'm not worthy. You know, that's, that's going to be the devil, not the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit wants to renew your fellowship with God. And if there's something in the way, he wants you to know what it is so you can get rid of it. The other thing is, once you have repented, the devil will still try to make you feel guilty about it. The Holy Spirit won't. So after you've really repented and, and you're still feeling guilty, you know that's the devil. On repentance and forgiveness. Should we continuously repent, right, even though we've already been forgiven? Should we continuously repent even though we've been forgiven? There's, there is a teaching out there, and uh, I've heard it from several different places, including some radio broadcasters, that says, we sh as Christians, we never should repent, because if we do, we're showing that we don't really believe that we were forgiven once and for all by Christ. They say that um, when... You, when, when Jesus died, all of your sins were still future because you weren't born yet, right? So Jesus died for your sins before you committed any of them. And therefore, we have to assume that his death was for all our sins, past, present, and future. And therefore, if, if we believe Jesus died for our sins, then even our future sins, he's already covered. And, and we, we can just live free from, you know, free from conviction or, or guilt, uh, no matter how badly we behave. Because we know that Jesus already died for those. And, 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 and some say if you confess your sin as a Christian or repent, it's like lack of faith. It's like insulting to God. Like, don't you know I already forgave you 2,000 years ago? What are you asking me to forgive you for now? I mean, that's really what the teaching goes like. And I think it's wrong. Um, obviously, all of our sins were future when Jesus died. So he died for all of the sins of our whole lifetime at that time. But we don't benefit from any of it until we come to Christ, right? I mean, if you come to Christ at age 20, well, you lived 20 years not benefiting from the fact that he died for your sins 2,000 years ago. You benefit by coming and squaring things away with him, you know, repenting and putting your faith in Christ. And, and it's, you know, same thing with the sins I commit afterwards. John said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, the teachers I'm alluding to they sometimes say that, well, John's not talking about Christians confessing their sins. He's talking about unbelievers. If unbelievers will confess their sins, he'll forgive them. But we don't have to do that because we're already forgiven. No, John is talking to believers. It's very clear throughout his epistle he's talking to believers. He says, if not if they or if somebody or if you, he says, if we, John writing it, was a Christian, if we confess our sins. So if he's a Christian and he feels like he's included among those that need to confess sins, then it must be that Christians sometimes have to need to confess their sins. And also, that statement, which is in 1 John 1, 9, is a, is a kind of the, a, a, it's, it's preceded by verse 7, two verses earlier, which is on the same thing. We said, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So both verses, 1 John 1, 7 and 1, 9, are talking about, being cleansed of sin. Verse 1 7 says, The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin as we walk in the light. Verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, we're cleansed from all sin. Walking in the light is confessing your sins. But in other words, those verses are talking about the need to be honest and transparent about our own sinfulness rather than trying to hide it. It says in Proverbs, He that conceals his sin shall not prosper, but he who 
confesses and forsakes them, she'll find mercy. In 1 John, that very passage I was referring to, it says right between those two verses, in verse 8 it says, if anyone says they have no sin, they deceive themselves, and the truth is not in them. Okay, so the opposite of walking in the light, the opposite of confessing your sins, is saying you don't have sin. You either say you don't have sin, or you confess that you do have sin. One is being honest, one's being dishonest. One is being in the light, being transparent. Hey, I'm a sinner. I sin. And I confess that. That's walking in the light. Being in the dark is pretending like you don't have sin, trying to conceal it. Remember, Jesus said in John 3, this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that, uh, he said that, but he that does the truth, I think he says, uh, they come to the light, that his deeds may be known to be wrought in God, and so forth. So the idea of being in the light or in the darkness is really a matter of being honest or dishonest about your own secret sin. You hide in the dark and pretend like you didn't sin, or do you come to the light and confess your sin? Now what's interesting is in 1 John 1, 9, he says, if we confess our sin, he's obviously talking about Christians, because the writer himself is in the we, and he also confesses his sin, he's a Christian. But it's in verse 7, he calls it walking in the light. Now, walking in the light isn't conversion. Walking in the light is walking. It's a process. It's what you do. You walk with God. You walk, you walk in love. You walk in the Spirit. You walk by faith. I mean, the, it's a walk. You walk in the light. It's your Christian life. And so confessing your sin is part of your Christian life. It's part of walking in the light. You do it all your life. Now, if someone says, but wait, doesn't that mean that, if, that, that you're not forgiven? If you don't confess your sin, I mean, how, what, what then happened to Christ's once and for all, you know, forgiveness and atonement? Well, he atoned for sins once and for all. But our walk with God is a relationship. It's not just a transaction. You see, a lot of people think of Christianity as a transactional thing. They know about being born again. They know about, you know, accepting Jesus or whatever they want to speak of. They know the transaction thing. You pass from death into life. You pass from darkness into light. You're tr uh, translated out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of his son. All that happens at conversion. That's a transaction. And some people think of salvation only in those terms. Oh, good. I, I had that transaction on such and such a date. Now I have a ticket to heaven. It's all good, no matter what I do. But salvation in the Bible isn't primarily a transaction. There is a transaction that brings you into Christianity, but it's sort of like being born into your parents' home was a transaction that brought you into their family. But now that you're in the family, you're in a family. You have parents. You're supposed to obey. You've got obligations. When you come into a family, you know, being a person doesn't just mean being born. You've got to survive the rest of your life. And when you're a child, what you're born into is a family with family obligations. You have to honor your parents, for example. Now, when we're born again, we're born into a family, too. Paul's very explicit about that. Jesus is, too. We have a father now, and you obey your father. So, obviously, salvation is not just the transaction of being born again. It's the transaction of being in a relationship with God, a proper relationship between your father and child. Uh, salvation is a relationship. Now, my wife and I have a relationship, and... Uh, you know, we got married, that was a transaction. Our wedding was a transaction. But when you get married, something changes when you have that transaction. You leave that ceremony in a different state of life than you came to it. You now have an obligation. You now have somebody you have to die for if, if it comes to that. You now have somebody you need to love and cherish and do things for you that you didn't have to do for them before. You, when you're these certain transactions bring you into a set of obligations, into a certain relationship. Now, my wife and I have been married for many years, but uh, I still, if I offend her, I still need to say I'm sorry. You know, I mean, what kind of relationship is it if you love somebody and you know you did something they don't like, but you say, ah, love is never having to say you're sorry. You're too young to remember that line, but there was a, there was a movie back in the 70s called Love Story. And for some reason, on the, on the posters for the movie, the tagline said, love is never having to say you're sorry. And I, what in the world does that even mean? You know? 
maybe if, if I saw the movie, maybe I'd know what they meant. But and I, that's a ridiculous statement. Love means you never have to say you're sorry. It's the opposite. Love makes you want to say you're sorry when you realize that somebody you love has been harmed or damaged or offended by what you did. And so what kind of relationship is it with God if we never say we're sorry when we do things that offend him? You know, I, I can't say, well, God, we got married, you know, back there on that date that I got converted. So we're married. Don't ask me to say I love you. Don't ask me to, for, to ask forgiveness. Don't ask me to apologize for anything because we're married, you know, for life. Well, anyone who treats their wife that way probably won't be married for life. Uh, but, I mean, Christianity is not just getting your ticket to heaven. It's getting into the family of God where you should have been in the first place and where you're going to spend the rest of eternity. And being in the family of God has a certain description. You've got a king. You've got a lord. You've got a father. That, that's a relationship that has certain obligations. And, uh, you know, I, what I think is that when he says, if we confess our sins, he'll forgive us and so forth, there's two levels of forgiveness. And again, I could compare it to marriage because the Bible does. But, um, I, you know, when, when you get married, you say, you know, we're going to stay together. I'm going to love and cherish you in sickness and health, for richer, for poor, for better, for worse. In other words, no matter what happens, I've already pledged my love to you forever, you know. Uh, and that means if you disappoint me, I still have to love you, and I will. I pledge it. You know, you, no matter, you know, if you hurt me, I'll still love you. Because that's what you pledge. It's an unconditional love that's pledged for, for a lifetime. But the fact that we pledge this to each other doesn't mean that it's okay for me to insult her or injure her or ignore her. That's, you know, that's, that's not okay. And so if I, uh, if I do something very thoughtless and my wife is offended, we're not divorced. You know, she still is pledged to love me forever. But that doesn't mean there isn't something unsettled that needs to be settled. Those of you who aren't married may not know this, but <laughs> when you are married, you're going to have to say you're sorry sometimes. Not because otherwise you'll be divorced and won't be married anymore, but because the relationship is maintained by keeping clear uh, channels of uh, forgiveness and uh, all that. So, if, like if my children do something that offends me, which is not hypothetical, um, I still love them. They're still my children. Uh, they don't have to get saved again. They don't have to be born into my family again. They're, that happened once and it's been done. But, but there have been times when they've uh, gone so wrong that we weren't communicating, sometimes for extended periods of time, because of the offense. Actually, they were offended by me uh, for reasons I don't know. But the, the point is, as long as there's an offense, it doesn't change the fact that I'm their dad and they're my children. It certainly changes things in the relationship until there's reconciliation. So to say I've been forgiven of all my sins, <coughs> excuse me, past, present, and future, uh, it has nothing to do with whether I still need to apologize or confess or repent of things that I've done wrong. The church is in... I, I once heard of... I won't name him. He's a very, very famous radio pastor. He's on every station that, that carries radio, that carries Christian radio in the country. He's, he's dead now, but he's still been on for years since his death. But I once heard him talking about Revelation, and he was uh, saying, there's never a time when we should tell non-Christians to repent. Only Christians have to be told to repent. Because uh, he's talking about in the churches in Revelation, the churches were told to repent. But um, he says, no, we, our message for unbelievers is just that you have to believe. But once you're a believer, sometimes you have to repent. Well, see, he's on the other side of this thing, and I don't agree with that either. Why do people have to not be balanced like me? Uh, but if someone says Christians never need to repent because they're forgiven already automatically, or he says only Christians need to repent because unbelievers don't need to repent, they just need to believe, uh, that's not taking the whole counsel of God either way. The truth is that Christians sometimes need to repent, and unbelievers do too. John the Baptist wasn't talking to Christians when he said repent for the kingdom of God's at hand. You know, he's talking to the Pharisees and everybody else. So, yes, we do need to repent. Uh, if we don't repent for our sin we committed today, that doesn't mean we've lost our salvation until we get around to it. Uh, but it means that we've, we've scarred 
a relationship. We've done some harm to the relationship. God's not thin-skinned or peevish. He tolerates a lot more than we do. The things that offend us, things that people say, especially if we're snowflakey, you know, someone says something that, you know, it's a trigger, you know, or something, you know. Uh, God hears that kind of stuff all, you know, he, he, there's about 7 billion people every day doing those things, and God sees it all. If he was easily offended, uh, he'd be tearing his hair out, you know, because, you know, he sees people murdering each other and, and cursing each other and, you know, cursing him. And, uh, I mean, he's a, he's a, God is love. And even though people don't love him, he loves them. And so he's, it's not like, um, it's not like when I sin, God just says, oh, I can't, I can't believe you did that. I, it's, it's like, I, I just, I just can't put up with any more of this. God can put up infinitely with anything. He's God. But what he wants is for the relationship to be gratifying to him and to us. And, uh, of course, he'll never wrong us, although sometimes we feel like he did, like Job might have felt like God had wronged him. But uh, the truth is, Job knew that God's always right, so, you know, and God hadn't wronged him. But God knows we're not always right, and, uh, and there are times when if we act like we're right when we're really wrong, he's rolling his eyes and thinking, I wonder when you're going to come to your senses and we can talk again, you know? Um, because it is a relationship to maintain. And even though you're not married, some of you, you have friends who have offended you. Uh, some, you might have roommates that offend you every day or, or disappoint you every day. But, uh, you know, you still... You still learn to get along, and sometimes you end up apologizing, probably, or confronting them so they will. Uh, the thing is that apologies and confessions are necessary in every relationship, uh, which is between imperfect people. Now, our relationship with God is not between imperfect people. It's just one imperfect person uh, trying to relate with a perfect person. Uh, but it's kind of hard when you're imperfect to keep up with a perfect person, so you've got to keep your Keep your guard up about your actions and make sure that you're keeping short accounts. I mean, you can go a long time without repenting, and God won't hurl lightning bolts at you. But you won't be enjoying God, and he won't be enjoying you. That's the point. The purpose of, that he made you for is so that you and he can enjoy each other. And uh, so, sure, you got to repent when you do wrong, just like you would if anyone else you offend. Jerry, you had your hand up earlier. Was uh, just thinking through about the idea of confession. All we kind of associated it with, like if you had um, eaten something that was bad, and it was actually making you feel sick. And feel, uh, there's a process where you actually have to uh, throw up mm -hmm. in order to get rid of the offense. And I've always kind of associated that with a confession. Mm -hmm. It's necessary to get rid of that. And if you don't get rid of it, it stays with you and can cause more harm. Mm -hmm. So it's actually confession is beneficial for the person that's confessing as well as the person that's being... You know, oh, yeah. It's a purging of something bad inside of you. Yeah, yeah for those who couldn't hear on the live stream, uh, he was saying he thinks of confessing sins sort of like uh, vomiting when you've got some poison in you or when you've got something that's making you sick and you vomit it out. Um, it's part of the healing. Mm -hmm. It's part of healing, yeah. Makes you well to get rid of the poison. Yes, uh, Gibson. Yeah. Um, Matthew 7, 22 says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you practice lawlessness. Is in this instance, is Jesus referring to genuine or to authentic miracles or deceptions that have the appearance of a miracle when we do these things not in the name of Jesus? Yeah, so when Jesus, uh, for the sake of those who might not have heard you, <clears throat> when Jesus said that many will say, Did we not uh, prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? Uh, he'll say to them, Many of them, uh, depart from me, uh, I never knew you. 
Uh, so he's asking, well, if Jesus didn't know him, what do we make of the things that they allegedly did? They cast out demons, they prophesied, they did miracles. Uh, were they real miracles? Or were they fake miracles? Were they demonic counterfeits? You know, I mean, that's, it's interesting because Jesus doesn't, doesn't answer that or make that the point. Uh, we ask it reasonably enough. I mean, if, if they weren't really Christians, how did they cast out demons in Jesus' name? It certainly makes it sound like they were Christians, or at least that they had all the appearances of being Christians. Even the demons must have thought they were. But, he, but the point, he introduces that statement by saying, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father in heaven. And then he says, some will claim they did this and this and this, and I'll say, I don't know you. So obviously, doing the will of the Father is what's required, but doing those things are not necessarily always the will of the Father, you know. If, if you do the will of the Father, you do. But some will say, Lord, we did these things. You say, well, that, I don't recognize that. So doing the will of the Father is what he's advocating there. And he's saying there's a lot of things, things that are impressive things, things that might even look very spiritual. I mean, casting out demons and prophesying certainly would seem like a badge of spirituality in most Christian circles. But uh, I don't know if he's talking about people literally doing those things or things equivalent to that that, that really... I don't know if you're using hyperbole to say, you know, they, they really, really did seem like real Christians, but they weren't. Or if he is talking about really people who prophesied, certainly there are false prophets. Uh, casting out demons is a little more difficult because we know that demons don't always respond when non-Christians try to kick them out, like the seven sons of Sceva. You know, the demons said, well, we know who Jesus is, we know who Paul is, but who are you? And they didn't come out. Uh, so how can uh, a person cast out demons. Well, I think James and John said to Jesus, we saw some people who were casting out demons in your name and they don't walk with us. So we told them not to do it. And Jesus said, well, don't forbid them because no one can uh, cast a demon out of my name and then lightly speak evil of us. Don't forbid them. But Jesus didn't commit to the idea that they were real believers. You know, he just said, well, <laughs> they're, they're on the same side we are apparently. So don't make them stop doing it. They're, we'd like to see demons cast out. But the point I, I would make is that there are no doubt going to be people on the judgment who thought they were Christians and who did view themselves as having been exorcists, you know. A lot of Catholic priests are exorcists, but a lot of them, I, I, I don't know what their relationship with God is like. Maybe, maybe it's not. Uh, did the demons really come out in their cases? Maybe, maybe not. It's awfully hard to verify that. Because, first of all, demons can be in a person without being visibly manifested. So if someone thinks they cast a demon out, actually there was a girl who uh, had some demons, a friend of mine, his, his daughter, and uh, I was among many people that at different times came to pray for her and so forth. And there was one night where it seemed to me like the demons left. I mean, she was, uh, over a period of time, her dad and I were uh, ministering, and, and at certain points it seemed like demons left. And then another one would show up, and you could tell it kind of rising up, and she's getting all choked up, and then she'd be, after it comes out, she'd be all relaxed, and then it'd start happening again. Anyway, I got the impression after about five or six seemed to have come out that she was free, and she was she slept peacefully that night. I thought, well, I think we're out of the woods here. But we weren't out of the woods. She had problems again the next day. So, But the point is you can think that demons have come out when they haven't. So I, someone who's not a Christian but fancies himself an exorcist might have some what appears to be success, casting out demons, but maybe the demons are just full of them, you know, maybe they're not really out at all. Or, of course, alternatively, it's possible that the name of Jesus itself is so profoundly intimidating to demons that even when non-Christians use the name of Jesus, there's times when the demons can't help but flee, you know. Those are alternative possibilities, but Jesus doesn't really go into the uh, explanation of how these people did these things if they weren't really Christians. That's one of the first things that comes to our mind when we read it. Okay, they cast out demons, they prophesied, they did miracles. Well, I mean, Hindu, holy men do miracles too, even apparently raising the dead sometimes. I mean, occultists do supernatural things. And I'm sure that a lot of miracles are faked. I mean, even in Christian churches sometimes, churches that, that kind of have a appetite for miracles in all their services. They it's sort of like in, in Pentecostal churches, for example, you kind of have to speak in tongues if you're going to be a long-term member because it's a rite of passage. You, you're not considered to be filled with the Spirit unless you speak with tongues. 
Now, I believe in speaking in tongues. I believe in being filled with the Spirit, but I don't. I, it's, I was never under any pressure to speak in tongues. I wasn't in a Pentecostal church. Actually, I was at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, when I got prayed for to be baptized in the Spirit. And no one, well, Lonnie Frisbee did try to kind of pressure me to speak in tongues, but I didn't accommodate him. But, uh, but for the most part, Calvary Chapel believes in those gifts and doesn't pressure people to speak in tongues. But in a Pentecostal church, people are pressured, so it's part of their culture. So they almost have to fake it. If, it. if they don't really get the real thing, they kind of fake it. And that's kind of easy to do in a Pentecostal church if you grow up there because everyone speaking in tongues sounds kind of the same. You know, it's like a, there's a certain set of syllables that are very common uh, if you've been in charismatic and Pentecostal churches enough where people do speak in tongues. You only start, a lot more saying the same things. I like to tell the story of a friend of mine who had been in Pentecostal circles before, but he came to Calvary Chapel and, he says, you know, when I go to heaven, the first thing I'm going to ask God is, what does Shandala mean? <laughs> <laughs> because Shandala is a word that you hear a lot in Pentecostal tongue speakers. Now, if I grew up in a church like that and I, and I didn't really get the gift of tongues, I could fake it probably and probably satisfy those people who are putting pressure to do it. Um, and there's probably people who, whatever they're under pressure to do, they can fake it. And, uh, and they can even think it was real. <laughs> <laughs> they can figure, okay, I passed that test, so now when I go to heaven, I'm a real Christian. And Jesus says, no, you didn't do the will of the Father. You might have spoken in tongues. You might have done miracles. You might have done all kinds of things, or thought you did. <laughs> remember, remember Jesus in that story. He doesn't, he doesn't commit himself to saying that they really did prophesy, cast out demons, two miracles. That's what they say. They say, Lord, we did this. We did this. We did that. So all he's committed to is that. So that's what they're going to claim. And he, he leaves out all consideration of whether these things really happened or whether they were genuine. So the question is a good question, but we don't, we're not given an answer to it. There's several ways we can go with it. But the point he's making is that doing the will of the Father lies in a different category than some of the things that are very impressive to, to religious people. Certainly casting demons out, that's impressive. Prophesying is impressive. Miracles are impressive. But a person who does those things is nothing if they don't have what God requires. What does God require? Anyone know? Love. This is my commandment, that you love one another. Paul said, if I speak in tongues but don't have love, I'm a sounding, I'm a gong sounding only. I'm just making noise. If I have all faith, if I can move mountains, if I have all knowledge and all understanding of mysteries, but I don't have love, I'm worthless. So he's saying, it doesn't matter how many spiritual credentials you can list on your resume, if you don't have love, none of them count for anything, because love is the one thing that is doing the will of the Father. And Jesus said, if you don't do the will of the Father, you're not going to get in. You might do other things or claim to do other things, but if you haven't done what God wants, it's going to be a rude awakening on the Day of Judgment. And that's what that passage, I think, is saying. Um, we can only speculate about some of those issues that, we, that that obviously come to our minds, but uh, it's not what Jesus was really addressing, so we can't answer with certainty. Yes? Yeah, uh, what is the, that you feel loving or love? Uh, what the acronym of the name is, but I can't... You don't have to feel loving. But you, you should, the question was, what if you don't feel loving, but you act in a loving way? Well... There's two possibilities even with that. One is you don't love that person, but you want them to think you do, so you're being a hypocrite. So you act in a loving way, you smile and, and do the things that you know you're expected to do, but you don't really care about them. Or you're simply being a good Christian. You can't always feel good feelings toward, your, toward yourself or others. I mean, feelings come and go. Some people have mood swings and so forth. And, and frankly, people you love sometimes make you upset. And sometimes it's because you love them. When your kids do stupid and dangerous things, you get at, mad at them. But it's only because you care. It's, you know, you don't hate them. You love them. So feeling good about somebody at the moment doesn't mean you don't love them. And, you know, the great commandment is that we love one another. And as it says, you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, Jesus paraphrased that in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew seven twelve. He said, what you want others to do to you, do that to them. So loving your neighbors, you love yourself, has more to do with what you do toward them than what you feel toward them. Because you can't command your own feelings. You can try to fight off bad moods or bad feelings, but 
you're not fully in control of that, and, and human beings just aren't made to be in control of all their emotions. But, but, but we, what we have to do is ignore emotions when they're inappropriate. If I feel like I really don't like that person, but I know I'm supposed to love them, well, I, I may not ever get to a place where I can really like them, but I can say, but I will serve them. I will lay my life down for them. Greater love has no end than that. Uh, you know, loving is what you do. Serving someone because you value them. See, you don't have to like someone to value them. You can see someone who you find obnoxious. You can find them ugly. You can find them evil. But you can say, but they're made in the image of my father. God made them because he loved them and he wanted them to be like me. He wanted them to have a relationship with, like I do with him. So I value them. They're worth something to me. Uh, I'm willing to die for them if necessary. Now, that's love. So, uh, and frankly, it's very heroic to say, I die for someone. How many people are going to get a chance to die for someone else? Not many. But you can lay down your life day by day. Lay down your preferences and your, uh, your rights and so forth to bless somebody else because you value them. You see, uh, that's what love is. Love is serving. Love is doing uh, putting somebody else ahead of yourself uh, because you value them, not, not because you're trying to make an impression on them. See, that's hypocrisy. I'm sure the Pharisees sometimes acted very loving. Certainly they acted like they loved God, but Jesus said, I know you that you have no love for God in you, he said in John 5. So uh, a person who has no real love can fake love, and that's going to look like doing the right thing for them, but if it's not in your heart, but what's in your heart is not the feeling of, not the emotion of fondness necessarily, but the decision to put, to value them as you value yourself, to figure that their well-being is, is, is as important as mine, even if I, if I don't like them. In God's sight, I'm probably as bad as they are. I've just been forgiven. So, I mean, who am I to think that my desires and my needs and my well-being is really more important than theirs? I'm just living in a fantasy if I think that. Because Jesus died for them as much as for me, so he must have valued them as much as he values me. So it's, it's placing the value on people that God places on them and then, and then living in re relation to them in such a way that you really do uh, place their well-being uh, at least on the same level as your own, preferably above. Jesus put his well-being below ours when he died for us. That's the greatest love. So, um, you know, when you don't feel love or what you don't feel what you think is love, a lot of times it just means you don't like them. And emotions, like, like liking is an emotion. Love is a decision. You can't be commanded to have any emotion because you can't keep, you can't obey a command that tells you, be happy all the time. I mean, we're told to rejoice, but rejoice isn't the same thing as be happy. Having, it, it means I choose to exult in the truth that God is in charge. I exult in the fact that God is my father, that he loves me, that he loves all people. I exult in the fact that God is sovereign over the world. I mean, I rejoice in the Lord. It doesn't mean I'm very happy about my present circumstances, but I can choose to rejoice, which isn't the same thing as just having the emotion of being happy. You can't command someone to be happy and then it happens. You can't command someone to like something. There are certain foods I just don't like. And it doesn't, even if God himself said, like it, well, I can't choose what I like. I can choose what I do. You want me to eat it? I'll eat it. I can do the right thing, but I can't like it if I don't like it. Emotions are not in our control, nor are they our responsibility. Only what is in our control can be our responsibility. But choices are in our, are in our control. I can choose to do something I don't really feel like doing. That doesn't mean I'll feel like it. I can't make myself feel like doing it or not. Uh, a lot of times I feel like doing things I shouldn't do. And I, you know, what's my responsibility? Stop feeling like doing it? No, just don't do it. You know, whether you feel like it or not, your feelings are temptations sometimes. Um, so, and this is something that, uh, in, in the recent decades, I feel like people have lost sight of they, they feel like, well, what you said offended me. Well, I didn't intend, you know, any offense. Well, I, but I was hurt. Well, I can't help that. Sorry. You must be very easily hurt. 
but it's almost like I'm responsible for you being hurt. People seem to think their feelings matter more than anything else, and they simply don't. Well, a Christian has to be wise, and most people even who weren't Christians, rational people, know it's not what I feel that matters, it's what I choose. I can be kind to a neighbor who isn't kind to me. It doesn't mean I like him. It can be very annoying. But uh, what I feel is not what's important. Feelings can be a real blessing when they're positive, and they can be a real drag when they're negative. But you don't choose what your feeling is going to be. You can kind of try to cultivate good feelings, but that won't happen instantly. But what can happen instantly, thank you, is that you have a duty and you do it. Uh, you choose to put that other person ahead of yourself. That's love. And it's not the same thing as hypocrisy, where I don't love them, I don't even want to love them, but I want to pretend like I do so that they'll think I do. That's, a, that's just being a hypocrite. Anyone else? Got a couple. We'll take yours next, and then Chris. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not sure I understand. You actually said it very well in St. Peter's Catholic. To love someone that you don't like, that's part of being Christian. Uh huh. It's to be sacrificial and to save. And um, I thought about repenting or uh, continually. I think I think I can't remember where it was. I read last time in Colossians or Galatians that we are to reevaluate ourselves regularly. Reevaluate our faith and our journey regularly. My, you might have been thinking of uh, 2 Corinthians 13. It says, yeah. says, examine your own selves and see if you're in the faith. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we do need to keep a check. I mean, we watch our health. Sometimes we watch our weight, you know. Sometimes we don't. <laughs> and sometimes we don't when we should. <laughs> I actually, the first thing I do in the morning when I get up is I go weigh myself. I don't know why. I don't have a weight problem, but I'm just curious. I haven't, you know, I, I'm older. I'm, am I gaining weight? I'm not. Not much. But, uh, but we do keep track of some things, you know. We keep track of our finances. We keep track of our um, health, different ways. Um, we need, certainly, if we keep track of those things, don't keep track of our spiritual state. We're not monitoring our thoughts and, and whether we're growing lukewarm or whether we still are hot. I mean then we obviously don't place that at a very high priority. Yeah, uh, Chris, you had another question. Oh, is Sophie you were raising your hand for her? <laughs> um, in Acts 2, Peter quoted Joel, and it said, you know, in the last days. What, is, what does that mean? Because I read a commentary that said Peter was mistaken. Like, <laughs> but, you know, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, right? So why, how could he be wrong? He was filled with the Spirit. That doesn't mean he couldn't be mistaken, but I don't believe he was mistaken. I think that, I mean, you know, we should be filled with the Spirit all the time, but that, that doesn't mean we're omniscient. You know, we could still be wrong about things, but uh, it's not saying that he was speaking under inspiration specifically, though he might have been. The main thing, I think, is that um, he, Luke records it as if we're supposed to trust what he has to say, because, I mean, I think Luke is giving the impression that he was right. I mean, he's speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit, and like a prophet would, um, and therefore he's right. And remember, uh, Jesus, when he rose from the dead, met with his disciples in the upper room that same day, or in the evening, and it says, then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures, meaning the Old Testament scriptures. So when Jesus met with his disciples after he rose, he, he taught them or opened their understanding to the Old Testament scriptures. So when they quote the Old Testament scriptures, we got to figure they knew what they're talking about, you know. One thing that's interesting is the passage in Joel that he quotes doesn't have the expression in the last days. If you read it in Joel chapter 2, it just says, afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Peter adds the words in the last days. But again, I believe that he was correctly understanding the scriptures. And therefore, even if he puts in a word or two that Joel didn't use. Peter's as qualified to do that as Joel is, you know. So was it the last days? Well, Peter's not the only one who did that. Um, Paul several times spoke about it. So did Peter. In, in 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter said, you know, that Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but he is manifest in these last days for you. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says, God, who at sundry times 
in diverse uh, manners, uh, spoke to our fathers through the prophets, has spoken to us in these last days through Jesus, through his son. Uh, James said to the rich men of his time, he says, you've laid up treasures for yourself in the last days. Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, he said, these things all happen to us to be a type for us who are living at the ends of the ages. John in 1 John chapter 2 says, beloved, it is the last hour. And as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, already there are many Antichrists who are probably know it's the last hour. I mean, all the way through, virtually every New Testament writer said they were living in the last days or the last hour or the end times or whatever. So were they wrong? Well, lots of people say so, but <coughs> I'd rather suggest that the people who say so are wrong um, because I think the apostles knew better than modern critics and modern scholars. I don't think you can learn as much in seminary as as the apostles learned from Jesus right from his own mouth. But what is meant by the last days? You know, we we live at a time where the last days is a phrase we used for the very end of time, just before Jesus comes back. Maybe, you know, the days just before the tribulation or something like that, including the tribulation. Those would be the last days. Uh, people often say, do you think we're living in the last days? And they usually mean, do you think we don't have much time left? You know, the last days we think of just a short period at the end. I don't think it's being used that way by Peter or Paul or John or James when they use that expression or the writer of Hebrews. Um, they were living in the last days of something. Now, there's two possibilities. Each of them is, po is, is a respectable view. Uh, many scholars believe that the last days refers to the whole age of the church, that when Jesus came, it began the last days, and the, and the last days will end with the second coming of Christ. So the whole period of the church age is the last days. This is a very common thing to read in some commentaries of a certain type. Uh, so they'd say, you know, the 4,000 years before Christ came was the majority of history, but the last 2,000 years is just the last third is the last days. Uh, that's, that's kind of the conclusion I reached when I first began to notice that all the writers of the New Testament said they were living in the end of the age or in the last days or whatever. But then I learned more uh, that made me change my mind on that, and that is that something that was very significant in the minds of Jesus and the apostles was the end of the Jewish age. Jesus said the temple would be destroyed, not one stone would be standing on another. Uh, that happened in 70 AD. He said this generation won't pass before this happens. And on three, to, uh, three or four other occasions, Jesus spoke about that generation too as the last generation of the Jewish age. Well, Second Temple period, basically, is what scholars would call it. But um, we could say the Jewish order. The, the Jewish order began with Moses in uh, 1,400 years before Christ and ended in 70 AD when the Jewish religion ended. The temple was destroyed. The priesthood was dissolved. Uh, the Jewish race was scattered throughout the world. There was no Jewish nation. There was no Jewish religion, no Jewish temple, no Jewish priests. It was the end. Uh, and the Old Testament prophets had... Uh, when you begin to realize how significant it was that, that Israel's religion and nation came to an end in 70 AD, you can see in the Old Testament how many times it's talking about the Messiah coming, but in the same passages it talks about this like final kind of judgment. It almost sounds like the end of the world in the prophets. But when the New Testament writers quote these prophets, they apply it to their own time. And you begin to see that <coughs> the coming of the Messiah introduced the new order, the new covenant order. And the old covenant order didn't finally vanish away until a generation later. Just like the Exodus made Israel a new people. They had been slaves in Egypt, but now they became a nation unto themselves. But they didn't have a land for another 40 years. It's like it took a generation for them to get all that golden calf Egyptian culture out of them and, uh, and to see themselves as the new people they had become. So there's a transitional generation between the Exodus when God took them to Sinai and made a nation out of them. And the end of that 40 years was when he brought them into the promised land and they became a nation in their own right with their own territory and all that. Likewise, when the new covenant was made at the cross, God gave them a generation. And you can see that until the temple was destroyed 40 years later, the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem were kind of confused about things. They still went to the temple. They still offered animal sacrifices. Now, Gentile Christians didn't. Paul, you know, Paul would, you know, he was very adamant that he would never allow that kind of stuff to be imposed on Gentile Christians. But the Jews who lived in Jerusalem, 
It's out of the Jewish culture, just like Israel when they came out of Egypt had other Egyptian culture. They had to get kind of purged of that. And it uh, took about a generation for the first generation of Jewish Christians to get purged of that, that whole dependence on the temple and the priesthood and stuff like that, too, and to become into their own at the time of the destruction of the temple. That period of time from the coming of the Messiah till the end of the old order was the last days of the old order. And when Peter quotes Joel that way, although Joel doesn't mention the last days, Peter applies Joel's prophecy to what he calls the last days. He, he quotes about, uh, you know, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions upon your sons and your daughters and your handmaidens and men servants. I'll pour out my spirit and they'll prophesy. Then it says, and there'll be fire and pillars of smoke and blood and, and there's going to be a you know, uh, and the moon will turn to, and uh, the sun will turn to blood, and or the moon will turn to blood, the sun will darken, stars will fall, all that kind of stuff. Why does he, why does he go that far in the quotation? That's all part of the quotation from Joel. But Peter's just talking about the outpouring of the Spirit. Why didn't he just quote the verses about the outpouring of the Spirit and just leave it at that? Say, this is that. Because that was connected with the other part, the judgment. That judgment is describing the judgment on Jerusalem in 70 AD, the blood and the fire and the pillars of smoke happened. The sky was darkened by the smoke. The blood look, the moon looks blood red when you see it through smoke. Uh, the sky, the sun is darkened by the smoke. Uh, you know, these things, it's a judgment prediction of, you know, after God pours out his spirit on the remnant in Israel, they don't have much time before he's going to have this judgment come on them. And Peter quotes the whole thing as this is that time. This is the last days. So we don't think that much of it because we live so long after it. You know, the fall of Jerusalem, how does that impact me? It's hardly even significant. It impacted the Christ early Christians very much because until Jerusalem fell, Christians often weren't sure, are we part of Judaism? Are we just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and now there's the Nazarenes? You know, we're the Nazarenes and then there's these different denominations of Judaism. It's when the temple fell that Christianity became clearly seen. It's not part of Judaism. It's its own thing. It's, it's totally independent of Judaism. But it didn't seem like it for that first generation after Christ came. So those, there was a transitional generation. And the apostles understood the Old Testament prophets, and Jesus had explained them to them, that the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost, that was predicted. It was predicted in Joel. It predicted in Isaiah. It was predicted in Zechariah. It was predicted um, in Ezekiel. You know, the, the Old Testament predicted that part of the Spirit. But also it predicted the destruction on the old order. Once the faithful remnant of Israel which were the ones who came to the Messiah, received the Spirit of God, then the apostates in Israel, who were not part of that remnant, would be judged. And that's what happened in that generation. So I think when they're speaking about, you know, we are living in the last days, we're living at the end of the age, I think they're talking about the temple age, the, the Jewish age, uh, which was near its end at that time. So there's two ways you could see it. One is the last days is just the whole period from the first coming of Jesus to the second coming of Jesus. And that's a very, actually a very popular notion. You might not hear it where you're going to school, but because where you're going to school, the last days means the end of the world. But uh, if you go out to seminaries and things like that, a lot of the scholars and commentators believe the last days just refers to the whole church age. And then a smaller number believe what I think. I think it's referring to the last days of the order that the disciples were born into and had lived their whole lives in as Jews. They'd always gone to the temple. They'd always lived under the law. So the time for that was ending. It hadn't completely ended it. And one thing that makes me uh, see it that way, too, is that the book of Hebrews was written just shortly before the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And it says <coughs> in Hebrews 8.13, after he quotes Jeremiah 31 about the new covenant, the writer comments on that quotation in Jeremiah says, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete. Okay, the first covenant made at Mount Sinai, the Jewish order, is obsolete. He says, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now, that's interesting. He says it's obsolete, but it's not yet vanished away. It's ready to, though. It's about to vanish away. What he's talking about is the Jewish order there. The new covenant came in the upper room. It's there. Therefore, the old covenant is obsolete. But it didn't vanish away until the temple was destroyed and the, and the priest was abolished and, and the Jews were scattered and there was no more Jewish religion, no more old covenant. Uh, you know, it's obsolete. 
So the period between the time that the Old Covenant became obsolete at the cross and the time it vanished away, as the writer of Hebrews talks about, was that 40 years. And that's, I believe, again, I think all the writers of the scripture were mindful of the fact that that's the last phase of the Jewish order. Uh, remember, Jesus even talked about, uh, in Matthew 24, about the end. That would, He said, this, this generation won't pass before this all comes to pass. Well, what, before what does? Well, he'd been asked by his disciples in Matthew 24, 3, and the parallels in Mark 13 and Luke 21, he was asked, when will these things be? Well, what things? Well, he'd predicted something. He said, not one stone of the temple will be left standing on another. That's what happened in 78. The temple was totally dismantled. Jesus knew it would happen. He predicted. They said, well, when's this going to happen? His answer was, this generation won't pass before it happens. And <laughs> so he's talking about that. And in that place, he says, and when you see this, such and such, he says, then know that it is near even at the doors. Remember, he said that it's even at the doors. Now, when James wrote in James chapter 5, he says, behold, the judge is at the door. Meaning the, the judgment of Jerusalem. It's like God's ready to judge the apostate Jews who crucified Christ. And it did happen through the Roman armies. And James said, it's at the door, using that language from the Olivet Discourse to say it's, it's about to happen. So I, 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 one disadvantage we have in not knowing or hearing much about 70 AD and what happened to the Jews is that we are living with a certain obliviousness to what was a very major phenomenon in the minds of the disciples. They knew the order was ending, uh, that they'd been raised in the Jewish order, and that was not insignificant to them. It's less significant to us, because nobody really has ever told us we have to go to the temple and offer animal sacrifices. There's no temple there. But they had to do that, they thought, and they'd done it all their lives. And you know, their whole idea, their whole perception of worshiping God was changing. That's what Jesus said to the woman at the well. She said, shall we worship at the temple in Jerusalem, or shall we do what my people do? We worship at this temple at Mount Gerizim, the Samaritan temple. And she said, the time is coming, and now is. Men will neither worship in Jerusalem nor at this temple. He was right. In 70 AD, both temples were destroyed by the Romans, so no one has worshipped there since. But he said, the hour is coming, and now is when people will not worship at this temple or in this mountain. But he said, but those who worship God in, will worship in spirit and in truth. So in other words, the way God is worshipped in the Old Covenant is by taking an animal to the temple and sacrificing it. Now he's worshipped entirely differently. We offer spiritual sacrifices, the fruit of our lips, our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service of worship. So the whole concept of worshipping God for these godly people, godly Jews, was for 14 centuries, it was go to a temple and kill an animal. But now that was coming to a complete end. The temple's going to be gone. No more animal sacrifices. The whole thing was going to be <coughs> replaced with just spiritual worship. And see, Jesus said it, sort of like the writer of Hebrews. He said, the hour is coming, and now is. Well, the hour is coming. These temples are going to be gone. No one's going to worship there. But already God is, is calling people to worship him in spirit and truth. He says God is spirit, and he's searching. He's seeking those who worship in spirit and truth. So he's in that transitional period. The temple's not gone yet, but kind of the temple worship is passe, because now there's a new form of worship that God's seeking. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's kind of a major theme in the New Testament. You remember Jesus? John the Baptist said, you know, the Messiah's coming. His axe is already set to the root of the trees. Every tree that doesn't bear fruit is going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. That's, he's talking about the judgment coming on Israel. There were some of them who were fruitless trees. He said his fan is in his hand. He's going to purge his threshing floor. Some of you are wheat, some of you are chaff. He's going to gather his wheat in the barn. He's going to burn up the chaff. You know, that happened in 70 AD. The, the apostate chaff in Israel was burned up. Uh, and, and the wheat, which was the disciples, the Jews who were faithful to God, uh, they were gathered into God's barn, into the church, and to safety. <laughs> so... Last days, you know, there's, uh, there's frequent references to last days, final hour, you know, the ends of the ages. These are terms that all the writers spoke of as their own times. 
but they were they were living between the time that Jesus instituted the new covenant at the at the in the upper room before his death and the time the temple was going to be destroyed which is the total end of the Jewish order uh, <coughs> it's been replaced it's obsolete and it was about ready to vanish away in their time as, as the writer of Hebrews said <coughs> excuse me so that's all is clear clear yeah okay. Thank you. well we only have uh, seven minutes left do you have a question you've been saying I don't know if I ask uh, maybe maybe not I say do it. And test me and see if I can answer a question in seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> How about meticulous providence and um, or being ordained for something and foreknowledge? Predestination and stuff? <laughs> Just a little topic like that? How can God, <laughs> How can God know what you're going to do and not really ordain it? <laughs> well, if God knows everything... Does that mean he predestines everything? Um, and, uh, you know, people ask me, do you believe in predestination? Well, of course I believe in predestination. The Bible uses the term four times in two passages. <laughs> doesn't seem to be the main, main subject of the Bible by any means. Some people make it the only subject that they want to talk about, Calvinists in particular. I don't know if you're a Calvinist, Calvin, but <laughs> you should be because your name is Calvin. But... <laughs> uh, but and Calvinists, uh, to them, predestination is like what the whole Bible is about, although it, you know, it's twice mentioned, twice, twice in Romans 8 and twice in Ephesians 1. And, <clears throat> but neither of them, neither of those passages say about predestination what Calvinists say about it. Calvinists say that God predestines and ordains all that occurs. He's predestined those who have become Christians to become Christians. We did it because we were predestined to. And those who are lost, they were predestined to be lost. We you have a tag on that? Question. Okay, well, let me just say this quickly and I'll take your question. Um, where you read about predestination in Romans 8 and Ephesians 1, twice in each of those two chapters, but it's all one discussion in each case, it is never said that human beings of any kind were predestined to become Christians. It says that God has predestined something to happen to Christians. He says that whom he foreknew, and he means by that the Christians, people who follow Christ, those are the ones he, whom he foreknew in, in Romans 8.29, whom he foreknew, he predestined to be transformed into the image of his son. So what is predestined for us? God is predestined that Christians will someday be like Jesus. That's our destiny as Christians. In other words, he didn't, he didn't say he predestined that we'd go to heaven. He predestined we would like Jesus. He didn't say that anyone was predestined to become Christian. The statement he makes, the people he's talking are already Christians. The ones that he foreknew are the Christians. And he predestined for them a certain end, and that is that we're going to be like Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 1, he says that uh, he predestinated us to adoption as sons. In other words, us, Christians... Paul, uh, Paul says that God has predestined that we Christians are to be adopted as sons. It never says that God predestined anyone to become a Christian. He does say in Ephesians 1, I think it's verse 4, that we are, uh, uh, that we are elect or he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. It doesn't say he chose us to be in Christ. He chose us in Christ. In Christ... We share in Christ's chosenness. In, in Christ, we share in his death and resurrection. In Christ, we share in his uh, exaltation, seated at the right hand of God. We are, sitting, we are exalted to heavy places, in, heavenly places in Christ. In Christ means that what he is, what happened to him, what his status is, is now imputed to us in him. He's chosen, we're chosen in him. It doesn't say we were chosen to be in him, like before we were in him, God chose, okay, you're going to be in him and you're not going to be in him. Those who are in him are chosen in him. That chosen status, that, that uh, status of being predestined for something is something that belongs to people once they become believers. Calvinism teaches that people are chosen to become believers, and God chooses that, not them. The Bible says the opposite. The Bible says you choose this day what, whom you'll serve, whether the gods that your father served beyond the river or, or, or this. As for me, my house will serve the Lord. There's uh, 
you know, the Bible always calls people to make a choice about becoming Christians. Once you become a Christian, you're in that group that God has chosen some things for. It's like if I, uh, if I was a young man, didn't have a family yet, I said, you know, uh, I'm going to start a business, and I'm, I'm determined that my children will have this business when I die. Well, I haven't decided who's going to be my children. I don't, in fact, I didn't, I never had any power over who's going to be my child, who's not going to be my child. That, that was the, that's the way biology decided those things. But that's a, neither here nor there. The point is, if I say I've chosen that my children will inherit all this, I could say that before I have any children. Don't know how many there will be, who they'll be. But I've already decided that whoever is my child is going to get that. And God has predestined that those whom he foreknew, he's predestined that they'll become like Jesus. That's the privilege we have, to become like Jesus ultimately. So uh, that's, there's nothing in the Bible that says that God has foreordained or predestined everything that people say or do. That's, that's really the claim that many Calvinists make. Some, some don't quite say it like that, and some do. Calvin did. The Westminster Confession of Faith does. It says everything that happens, God foreordained it. So Adam and Eve fell because God made it inevitable by, by ordaining that they would fall. Uh, if, if you became a Christian, it's because God ordained it. But if your neighbor doesn't become a Christian, God ordained that they couldn't, that he didn't want them to be. Or else he would have ordained that they would because he gets whatever he wants. He's sovereign. So, I mean, that's not what the Bible teaches. But that, that, that view originated with Augustine in the 4th century. It was not found in any of the church fathers before Augustine. But Augustine influenced the church more than any other theologian in history, and so it became part of not only Roman Catholicism, but also the Reformation. It's considered to be Reformed theology, but it really goes back to Augustine. That's the short answer. Uh, but you had a question. Uh, related or unrelated to that? A little unrelated to it. Um, the book of Malachi talks about um, how the children of Israel, God is kind of completely done with them constantly sinning and him putting them in exile. So he's like, look, you stop sinning, you come to me fully and take away all of your, your gods and only serve me, that's when, um, like, the new temple and, like, um, our relationship will be complete. So do you think that also uh, correlates, I guess, to, like, the book of Revelation? Does that make sense? Well, what you just described is kind of the teaching of the whole Bible, you know, in a way, you know? leave your idols behind, come to me, be my children, you know, enjoy what I have for my family, and worship me. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure if you were intending to be that general, if you had something a little more specific in mind, but does that correlate with the book of Revelation? Uh, in that general sense, absolutely. I mean, we read in Revelation 9 that even when all these plagues came on, it says they still didn't repent of their fornication and their sorceries and their, you know, murders and things like that, and thefts, um, as if God wished they would. You know, I mean, it's, it, it specifically says, although this all happened to them, they still didn't repent. I mean, that, that very statement suggests they should have. That, was, that would have been the best thing to happen. That's what God wanted to happen, but they didn't. So we, we find the book of Revelation still has sort of the same kind of appeal, that God is still trying to bring people to give up their idolatry and their sin and, and follow him. But I suspect your question was more specific, or am I wrong? Was it? Um, it would be hard to explain. Not, not trying to put you on the spot. I just can't answer more specifically unless I have a more specific idea of what you're asking. But but if... I think yeah. it's more of like, because in the book of last book, so you talked about the children of Israel, but it's like now we're in the book of New Testament, well, yeah. Mm. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, sometimes when a thought of a question comes to mind, it takes a while to formulate it in your mind, and since we're in a hurry here, back to we've gone one minute over, uh, not that we're that strict about it, but uh, in a hurry, it might be hard to really formulate it in a way. Maybe everyone else understands better the specific thing you, you have in mind, but... Um, Whenever, you know, when people ask me questions about the Bible, sometimes there's several different issues that kind of get touched on in the way they, uh, they state their question. But I know that not all those issues, what they're asking us, I'm trying to okay, what is the, what's the focus of that question so I can 
instead of say everything I can think about that subject that I could address it more specifically. Uh, feel free to email me or something if, with the, if you want more, if you want to get more specific about things. You know, uh, appreciate everyone coming out, and uh, it's good to see all you guys. Expected more from you guys, just more, more curiosity, more, uh, but, you know, obviously, uh, it's easy to be shy when you're, you, you shouldn't be shy, so... How come, he has to, how, come, how come he has to raise his hand for you? I, I, I was going to raise my hand. <laughs> anyway, so we do this, uh, we do this uh, the first Saturday of every month. You're always welcome to join us if you'd like. Um, so Thank let's... Thank you again for uh, having us tonight. Appreciate that. Well, sure. You gave me a reason to be here by you being here. <laughs> if you didn't come, I'd be really bored. <laughs> Okay, so let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this night, and we ask you to bless and, and guide each one of these uh, people as they go, wherever they go. There's uh, tomorrow's Sunday, many, perhaps most, will be in church somewhere or trying to find a church that's open. I thank you that I heard today that the Supreme Court just uh, overruled uh, California's ban on indoor church services, so maybe all the churches will be open, or I don't know. But I do pray for those who preach the word tomorrow in pulpits or on Zoom or wherever they do it, that they will have your spirit inspiring what they say, that they'll be able to speak the truths that are timely truths for your people, the things that are the oracles of God that need to be heard, and that uh, your people, your sheep will be fed. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Alrighty.